Um, upcoming event, Portland, we're going to have the symposium right. here in June of next year. Uh, Gail Larson and I know we can get a lot of people here. The President Greg Schrammick and the uh, symposium chair don't think we can do it, and Dale and I know that we can get all the people from Western Washington and Oregon, and we will need lots of volunteers, so I hope that I'll see many of you there next June. Uh, a little bit about myself. I grew up uh, probably seven miles from the Southwest Ferry Dock in West Seattle. I grew up right above the Palm Prairie Landing and uh, grew up watching my dad make early American knobby leg furniture for my mom on his shopsmith. He was so enthralled with the shopsmith that he had two of them. However, uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s, little girls in our house, and even little boys, uh, did not play with power tools, so dad never showed me how to do anything. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1979. I was the only one that had the sawdust gene, so I inherited the shock smell. And um, I was a little arrogant. Uh, the first thing I did, uh, I had been a spinner and a weaver, and I built a loom with hand tools. We didn't have the money for a loom, so I decided to buy a book and build a loom. And my dad was extremely proud of that loom. It's a full-size loom. So, but it wasn't perfect because I didn't have a good tool. And when he died, I got the good tool. And then built a second loom and decided I liked wood a lot better than I did cloth. Uh, I had my reasons. You know, spinning and weaving were fun. I still have my looms and three spinning wheels that my dad built. But um, talk about my arrogance. I figured, well, if dad could turn, he, you know, he grew up in western Nebraska at you know, had no access to anything. He figured it out. What, what can be to turning wood? So I got a piece of square, kiln-dried, probably eastern maple, put it on the lathe, just looked at the tools, grabbed one, stuck it in there. And I thought, this isn't as easy as I thought. I think I know what I'm doing. So I did watch Shage. I went to a shopsmith class, watched how they did it, and they didn't do it the way I did. So I had to learn. I moved to Portland area in 2004, joined the clubs down there, went to every uh, class, open studio, open shop, workshop that we had, and I think I've learned a few things. So um, what I'd like to do before I get into my demonstration, since everybody likes to see chips, I'm going to show a video of a, uh, my trip to Turkey. Uh, AAW, I had been on the board less than three months when they called me and said, how would you like to go to Turkey to represent AAW for International Wood Culture Day? And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. So this video is from our event in Turkey. It's fairly short. Can you switch to the video? It's on. It's on. Oh, okay. It's on. It's everything, and I think all of you belong to a wonderful, wonderful organization, and you have an exciting hobby. Um, what I'd like to do next is show you, I know some of you have phenomenal shops, and I want to show you a not-so-phenomenal shop that's functional. So, my shop is half of a two-car garage. How many of you are also in your garage? Do you, does your whole car or your whole shop take over in the garage? Yeah. yeah, yeah, well my car wants to be inside too, so. Um, as you can see, uh, I've got my lathe, bandsaw, this was the stand for my old Nova lathe that is now my tool bench at the bench of swords. Um, there it is, 
It's, you know, it's part of my dad's legacy. It's going to be with me for a long time. It's my drill press and my disc sander. Um, it takes up a lot of space, but it fits under there. Uh, when I had a new roof put on last year, I had the space in my garage because I have a slope ceiling. And I thought, you know, this would be perfect for a studio. I mean, I have a shop, but I decided to name it a studio, too. So I had this loft built. It's 10 by 20, and this is the area where I do my piercing. So you can see it's set up. The table is set up just like here because I'm getting old and I can't remember where to put anything, so I have to set up exactly the same, uh, regardless of where I am. I didn't bring the pink lamp. I've got a black lamp. Um, I do have an air conditioner up there. Uh, last week, I had the skylight put in. I guess you can't see it too well, but there's a vented skylight, which I think is going to be wonderful. And I do have some bowl storage up there. So, that's my shop. Um, what I'd like to, Jamie asked me to talk some about design, so I'm probably going to be all over the place. I guess we can shut the computer off now. Um, Get rid of that. I think I'm done with it. And probably we only need one, not two. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about turning thin. If I were to turn thin, it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> We'd be here all night and you wouldn't see much of anything. So I'd rather tell you how I turn thin. Um, then I'd like to talk about design. And then I'll get into the actual piercing. Um, so I'll try to keep pay attention to the clock because I know we have to be out of here at a certain time. It's nice out. I want to get home and enjoy the evening stuff. So a little bit about thin turning. One of the things about AAW, there is a wealth of expertise out there. And wood turners are probably the most generous, most giving people I know. Um, Pat Bookie from Alaska, a couple years ago, a symposium, he and his wife, he does the turning, the turning, and she does piercing. And he, I went to her, their demo, and she was showing piercing. And he talked about thin turning. Well, I couldn't go to his demo. He said, you know, he was, he was going to give all the secrets. So I got home and I called him up and said, uh, this is Kathleen Duncan. Can you give me your secrets about thin turning? I couldn't make it to your demo. We talked for over an hour, and he told me all about turning thin. Um, some of his ideas I use, some of them I don't. Last year I went to the Oregon Symposium. How many of you were down there and saw Ben Fogg? Yeah, he was great. He turned green wood. So I just said, okay, Ben can do it. I'm going to start turning green too. But some of the things I learned from Pat are when you turn, and I'm going to have to use my cheat sheet, you don't just start and go straight down and try to get your thinness. You work a crescendo where you start on one side and you work in. The same that you do as on a regular bowl, except you have to be very, very cautious uh, to pierce, you have to have two millimeters of thickness. That's not very much thickness. So what I do, and I'll pass this around. This is a bowl, and it shows the different steps that I took in turning. When it's bowl orientation, you do it the same way you do a big bowl, from the outside to the inside. If you're doing hollow forms, for instance, I should have there. Something like, let's see, where's the camera in front? Okay. If you're doing something like this, which is spindle orientation, what I do on these is drill them out with a Forstner bit and then use hollowing tools and start from the inside to the out. So, uh, but it's the same thing you're measuring with calipers all the way down. So, the calipers I use are digital calipers. Anybody familiar with these? Okay, let's pass them around. These, um, when I first started turning thin, I was doing 330 seconds. 
It's really, really hard to measure in 3.30 seconds, and I did not have a digital calendar, so I ordered these. And they have both English and metric. As soon as I bought it, I switched to metric. There's just, there's no way you can turn in English. You know, you're either doing fractions of an inch or trying to do <laughs> fractions, and it's impossible. So what I do is I measure to two millimeters. That's, that's what's set. And then I start nibbling away, and as long as you measure, you stop being constantly measuring. You don't go through the sides too often on this shape. Um, I, this shape is a lot easier to go through the side because you get down at the bottom here, and it's a lot harder to measure. And also, it's harder to see. When you, when you have a bowl, you can look into it and see what you're doing. It's really hard when you're hauling. So, do you want to pass this around for me? Thank you. So what I, when I started, I started with only really dry wood, and what I would do, would take, take a piece, that um, bowl is London plain, and it's got a crack in the bottom, that's why it's a sample piece. Uh, what I did, I left turned it to one inch, let it dry, and I just weigh things, mark it in grams, how much it weighs, and then periodically I'll weigh it again. When it stops losing weight, I figure it's dry. Um, it may, you know, change a little bit, but it's, it's pretty dry at that point. So for bowl, when I do dry, it's going to be as dry as I can get it. All if it's in the winter, I'll take it in the house for a while so that it has house temp, house humidity in it. Um, then after watching them, I decided to start turning green. Green is, it, it, it's totally different. You have to turn, start to finish in one sitting. And what I do when I'm doing, a lot of times, for even the dry turning, I'll turn the outside first, especially the dry turning. I'll do the outside first, leave it overnight, then go back and refine the outside, and then do the inside. For a green turning, you do the outside, and then you immediately do the inside. And you cannot go back. Anybody that's ever turned thin, and you're all going to turn thin this month, <laughs> that's your challenge. I heard it. So when you turn thin, um, when you're getting down to an eighth of an inch or less, don't try to go back to refine something when you're two inches into it, because your wood will have moved even in that length of time. And you may find that you have a zipper around it or a great big chunk out of it because it moves too fast. Stuart Mortimer, I took a class from him years and years ago down in Portland, and we did a thin thing, and he kept saying, oh, you can't go back, you can't go back. Well, I went home and I didn't believe him. He was right. You cannot go back. <laughs> it blows up on you, especially if you're trying to do thin. Um, so that's pretty much what I have. Uh, one thing about wet turning, and the reason Benfo turns wet, is you can put a light behind it. And it's really, really nice to be able to put a light behind a piece and then look for the same intensity of light coming through the whole time. Can't do that so much in dry wood. Maple, sometimes you can, but not always. It's, it, the, there's not enough liquid in the pores. When I'm sanding, I sand to 600 usually on my pierced pieces. Um, another thing I found when I'm turning thin and measuring, sometimes I'll get inside maybe a couple inches, and I know there's a lump in there. I can see it with the calipers, I can feel it with my finger, but I can't figure out, especially with when a, a thin or a small vessel, I can't figure out where to put that following tool. So what I'll do is take a pencil and approximate where I think that lump is and then measure with the calipers and then I can remember what was about an eighth of an inch inside of that line and then I can get rid of the line that way. So that's um, scrapers. One of the things Pat Bookie told me is, is don't be embarrassed to use a scraper on your thin turning. And I started using negative rate. I use a 60 degree grind so that um, I can, it's the same grind top and bottom, and then I can, if I'm doing it, using a scraper for the outside, grind it one way. If I want to do the inside, I just flip it over and grind it the other way. Um, 
That's all there is to turn it down. You know everything there is to know about it now. Any questions on that part? Yeah, in the back. What type of wood? Thank you, that's a good question. What type of wood? Um, to turn thin, you need to have straight grain, fairly, um, pretty plain wood, really. Uh, I find big leaf maple works okay. I have a large amount of big leaf ma maple. Um, my house is right next to WSU Vancouver, and there are huge big maple trees on WSU's property. They trimmed them, and I bought all that wood. And it, that's what that little black one going around is. It's uh, WSU maple. Um, you don't want anything like oak that's white gray. Sycamore is a nice wood to use. Um, I've done, let's see, um, elm or no, box elder is what Ben Foe uses. I have some box elder, but I haven't used it in thin turnings. I, I don't have a large inventory of thin turnings. I've been doing it three years and have given quite a few of them away and a few of them have sold. So I don't have a lot. And I haven't, other than the maple, I haven't really tried a lot of woods. But you can't use anything figured. Madrone is beautiful. If you have some straight grain, plain old madrone, you know, you got a big piece of burl, but it had some straight grain on it, that's perfect to use for a thin turning. Any other? Yeah. So on your black and gold piece, that's, yeah. what did you use? for the black, and what did you use for the gold? Okay, um, the black is gesso. Mm -hmm. It's just plain old black gesso that artists use. The gold is Gilder's paste. Molly probably talked about it, or Molly will. See, I get to scoop Molly on everything. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving away all of Molly's secrets. Um, Gilder's paste. Uh, I, I did a couple with gold leaf, the, and I spent hours and hours trying to gold leaf and to get the Jack Vestry look. You can't do it. You have to have a dust-free environment. My house is not dust-free. Yeah. My shop is not dust-free. There is, and I just don't have the patience. So I ended up getting paint thinner, getting rid of every bit of the gold leaf and a demo trail and picking all her pick and picking all the gunk out of the holes. And then I, I went to Gilder's Pace. Maybe someday when I get good, I'll try gold leaf again. So when you do the Gilder's Pace, is it on the lathe? Is the lathe No, it's, it's off lathe. Every, everything is done. The holes are in and the black is on the outside. And then my fingers aren't long enough to get quite to the bottom of that little black one. And that's, that's the hard part of it. Questions? Other questions? So do you questions? thin the gold? Or how do you get that? It, it looks pretty solid. Well, you thin it with, if it gets mine, I went to use it the other day and it was rock solid. So I looked at the, I read the bottom of the can. Paint them. Okay. And so I got a dowel. I mean, it was so hard that I was mashing it with a dowel. Half inch dowel worked really well. <laughs> and um, then I looked at the rest of them and I just dumped paint thinner in it. Uh, and I actually got mine too thin, but it'll dry out a little bit. Other question? Why do you only go to 600 grit? Um, because it's good enough. You know, I, I could go, why did I go to 600 grit? Um, because I don't have eight, I do have 800, I don't have, I got 1200 too. I'm lazy. <laughs> it works. All of the above. Other questions on the turn, yeah. I forgot to ask you, Kathleen, when somebody asks a question, could you repeat it like I, 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 I will try to repeat the yeah. question. If I don't, you know, make this, okay. Okay. give me the merits or something, please. <laughs> okay. Questions? Something turning? Oh. Okay, hearing none. Um, go to design, I think. Um, I started doing some research on design. I thought, ooh, gee, I better talk about form because you can have the most beautifully turned, executed piece, and if it doesn't have a good form, it's not a good piece. So I started looking around and I, I have gone to a lot of demonstrations and I've heard real artists talk about things, form and design. So my background is computer science. I spent 32 years writing software for Washington State University. 
I like things that are organized, I like formulas. So my idea of form, you know, unfortunately, there are formulas for figuring out good design. Um, anybody heard of a catenary curve? Okay, with the chain? You know, how do you get the best bowl shape? Well, you take a catenary curve. You know, if you want a tall, hollow form, there's your shape. If you want a nice bowl, there's your shape. Um, I happened to pick up, I was looking at my catenary form, and I picked up the last issue of AAW. Ron Fleming was the pop merit recipient this year. And if you look at that shape, I can't, I don't think I can hold my chain up at the same time. Oh, close. It's really weird seeing everything in reverse. There. He got it, didn't he? I doubt that he used a chain to get his shape. But artists instinctively know what their shape is. Anybody recognize this bowl? It's probably been here a few times. This is one of Dale Larson's bowl. Um, Dale did this in 2007. I watched him turn it start to finish. And he doesn't measure anything. He doesn't use any chains. But again, it's got a perfect shape. It's, it's just instinctively, he knows. So you have the form, the shape. You want your, your, your vessel to come off the table a little bit so your curve, if it's got a foot, like Dale's bowl has a foot in it, but the curve, if you visualize the curve, it goes completely through the foot. He doesn't lose the curve at all. So this is, you know, this is one way of looking at form. Then, um, everybody's heard of the golden mean, okay? Have you seen the golden mean gauges? You've got these here? Okay. Um, so this, it, is anybody not familiar with it? Okay, well, I'll, I'll keep this part short then. I put this up to Dale's bowl, and by the, bowl, the um, golden mean, the diameter, the height is supposed to be 1.618 of the largest diameter. So I measured Dale's bowl, and then using the gauge, it's a little bit off. But it's all, it's almost the, the right height. And then if you look at, at the height, the base should be 1.618 of the height. And if you look at Dale's, he got it right there. So he didn't measure this. He doesn't use this, but he has an eye. So I think for those of us that haven't done a lot of turning or haven't really evolved a form that we really are comfortable with, just keep playing with the tools that, you know, play, play with your gauge, make one of these gauges in the handout I have. If you don't have the uh, instructions for making one, they're really easy to do. And I've got that in my handout. Um, the candlestick, this was a demo piece from Ellie Avicera. Has he been here? Okay, you can have Ellie too. Um, I grabbed this off the shelf and I thought, I wonder if Ellie's piece, you know, falls into the... Yeah, it does. The base is, um, it's divided. So he's got this nice uh, golden mean shape there. And the base was uh, the right diameter. There's another way of looking at, if you don't want to use your gauge, uh, there's a rule of thirds. Everybody familiar with the rule of thirds? Okay. Your bowl, the, the diameter, the largest diameter, the base should be one third, and the height, got that right down, the height should be either um, two thirds or one third of, let's see, the height is um, two thirds or one thirds of the largest diameter. And so if you look at this bowl, it, it figures. It follows all the rules. And then if you have a large part in your bowl, if it comes out, if, it, if it's a closed form, 
The largest diameter should be either one-third from the top or two-thirds from the top. I think they're probably more appealing if it's one-third from the top. And then um, this, there was an article about, by Russ Fairfield. I believe he passed away a couple years ago. Yes. He did, right? Yeah. And he also took it one step further and gave you um, a formula for figuring out what the diameter at the top should be in relation to this. And it was, take notes, Jamie. I'm going to test you on this. <laughs> it should be half the distance from the top to the, the largest diameter. If, it, if it's at the top. That's so that's what the inside diameter should be. Uh, I think that that was what he came up with uh, just by looking at different, examining different holes and, and measuring them and just looking at what's, what's pleasing. And really, the best form, you have to look at a piece yourself and decide if it's a good form. Um, the piece that I passed around, I did two of them. Um, I think the one, yeah. I should have passed these together because this one has a really bad form. I think if, if you look at it next to the other one, um, I have a bad catch on this at the bottom. I never catch down here. I had the inside completely done and I was finishing the foot and I had a catch and I had to get rid of an awful lot of material so what went from a really attractive shape went to a not a very pretty shape. So, if, so the other one come back. We could pass them around together so you can compare them. Okay, well, it's right there. maybe it'll come back again. Then they can go. Uh, well, I'll pass them around again later so that you can compare them. The reason I like the shape on the first one that went around, but I rejected it because when I looked at it, the piercing was too close to the top. You know, it was very well pierced. Everything I liked the design and everything. But I thought it was too close to the top. So then I did, but, well, I'll do the second one. I'll make it perfect. Well, I messed up the bottom, and I did this a couple days ago, so I didn't have much time to try another one. So um, design opportunities or demo opportunities, right? So that's what I have to say about